Can I just welcome everyone there? We uh, can I uh, welcome everyone for joining us there today. Um, in particular, uh, Pat Smith and Peter McMahon, who are our guest speakers today, and we're we're very appreciative of the time they've put in in preparing presentations today, as well as joining us. And thank you to everyone who's able to join us uh, live at the moment as well. Just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded, and we'll make it available then through the Chagas website and YouTube channel in the coming week. Um, I'll just I'll give you a quick rundown on what we're, we're planning to do. We'll have a presentation from Pat and then some questions and then follow up with uh, Donald who introduced Peter McMahon and again follow up with questions and hopefully we'll have time at the end to cover uh, maybe one or two other questions that are coming in through the, the Q&A button. We have a poll running there as well and it'll give us an idea of who our audience is and uh, maybe some of the, the plans that you have as well in terms of equipment. Um, so just to give a little bit of an introduction to the event today, um, there's a growing interest in the horticulture industry to reduce energy costs and use more sustainable energy options. We're fortunate to work in a green sector that has good carbon credentials and we're striving to make them even better. But the cost of business is increasing. The price of electricity, gas and fuel in Ireland have increased by 19.6% in the last year. And carbon tax is due to rise by €7.50 per tonne per year until 2029. With this in mind, the industry is already looking at sustainable energy produced where it's needed, when it's needed. So our two speakers today are, as I mentioned, Pat Smith and Peter McMahon. Pat Smith is Managing Director of Local Power, a supplier of solar and energy solutions for businesses and homes. And Pat has significant experience in the solar energy business and has worked with commercial and domestic customers to supply solar energy systems and EV chargers, amongst other options. Pat will discuss the benefits of oh, uh, solar installation and a look at some of the key equipment required for an efficient setup. And then Peter McMahon is Technical Sales Director of European Industrial Chillers. And Peter will provide an overview of the heat recovery using multifunctional heat pumps, which are already extremely popular in other industries. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Pat and uh, allow Pat to share his screen. Um, or do we want to take the poll results before we go to that? Just as you're setting up, um, Pat, we'll go through the results maybe if that's okay. Uh, just of the people who have joined us, uh, mushrooms, we've got 25% of the audience. Nursery stock is 50%. And then we have people joining from fruit, protected crops. Uh, and some others. Um, there's a question there. Are you using any of these already? So we have solar PV. We've got six out of uh, 12 people who voted there. EVs, we've got three users there. And heat pumps, we've got three people saying they're, they're using them. And then lastly, our question is, are you looking at using any of these supports in the coming year? Um, SEAI grant, we've got 30%. The DAFM grant is 60%. Accelerated capital allowance isn't at all popular, 0% there, and uh, producer organization supports, there's four people there with 31%. Okay, so thanks for uh, joining that poll. I'm going to close it off now, and I'm going to hand over to Pat. So, Pat, take it oh, away. Well, thank, thank you very much. Can people see my screen there? Yeah, we yeah, can see it. Yeah. And I'm going to turn off my camera and my microphone for, for the presentation, okay? And I'll ask Peter and Donald to do the same as well. So uh, thank thanks you. and good evening to your participants. Um, I've been asked to talk about solar PV and battery storage, uh, particularly as it relates to the agriculture and horticulture uh, sector. And over the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, hopefully you'll get a good flavour of what solar PV can do for your business and the things that you should be looking out for in the context of um, having a successful installation at that, if done properly, can last for decades to come. Um, solar generates um, energy DC from daylight. People often say, well, the sun doesn't shine in Ireland. Um, it's very much related to daylight and the length of the day, and solar works very well in Ireland. Uh, on a dull day, obviously, the production will be low, but on a bright day, uh, the production is high. Uh, it converts, uh, um, um, the energy is converted to AC by an inverter and um, it is then used in the business. It comes into the, um, into your electrical network at a slightly higher pressure. So uh, your building or your business will prioritize the solar generation in, uh, in preference to grid 
and it all syncs automatically. Uh, solar is very predictable. Um, normally for clients, we do a generation report that will give you an idea of how much uh, solar PV uh, will generate on a particular roof in a particular part of the country. Um, and it's predictable within 2% and uh, guaranteed. And another positive benefit of solar PV is that there's no moving parts. It's all electrical. And uh, so maintenance is uh, generally very low, but we come back to that. Grants of up to 40% can be secured. I think you're very aware of that yourselves as farmers. Uh, VAT is refundable, which is a benefit for non-VAT registered farmers. And the 100% accelerated capital allowances, uh, while not popular, uh, according to Donal, it's still a valuable benefit, uh, particularly if you are a sole trader, which I know most businesses today are more than likely companies. Um, and obviously uh, the paybacks uh, depend on uh, the price you're paying for electricity, Currently, the system cost and the generation that you expect and normally are between three and six years. And I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. New developments is happening in solar. Um, um, later this year, there's going to be a generation tariff introduced. Uh, for single phase, that's going to be up to six kilowatts of export. For three phase, it's going to be up to 11 kilowatts of export. And they're also going to bring in a simplified system for uh, applying for export of up to 50 kilowatts. Um, it's um, that's the simple part. Um, every uh, person that wants to export will have to get an analysis done. And my suspicion is that the grid is going to fill up reasonably quickly. So if it's something that you want to do, uh, it's something that you should uh, keep a very close eye. New planning uh, exclusions are, are, um, are down coming for the last three years, uh, ladies and gentlemen, very disappointing that a simple measure like uh, planning exclusions uh, couldn't be introduced without the palaver that's going on, they now want to put it out to public consultation. In the UK, for example, you can install up to a megawatt of solar on a roof without planning permission. A megawatt of solar is nearly 6,000 square meters. In Ireland, uh, they're looking for planning permission if it's over 50 square meters. It's ridiculous. And um, it's very disappointing that that simple measure could not be uh, sorted out at this stage. Um, there's also uh, with ESB networks, and we've met them a number of times, and in fairness, they are working towards a simpler grid uh, a connection process. They're uh, working towards uh, export limitation using the inverters uh, for installs. So there's a lot. There's a lot happening in this space, but it needs to happen now. And particularly in the context of what Donald said, where energy prices are starting uh, to escalate. Uh, battery storage. Uh, we've installed on many farms to act as a buffer between usage and generation. I see battery storage being very significant for many businesses in the future. Um, they're a bit expensive at the minute, but I see them uh, playing a role for peaking at peaking times where electricity is very expensive um, and using surplus solar energy to displace that part of, of your bought in energy or indeed using nitrate energy uh, to basically, um, uh, um, so, but it comes down to economics. And just at this point in time, I think it's still a bit, a bit expensive. Just to give you an example, that's just a 50 kilowatt solar system, how it generates during the year. So January and December, the low, lowest generation months and uh, April, May, June, July are the highest generation months. And normally without a grid connection, you'd be trying to, and the red line there uh, is the base load of the business. You're trying to size the system so that as much of, your, of the energy generated is used in the business. And that limits the percentage that uh, you're able to basically uh, advise a farmer to do. So, and, and one good thing with solar, it's, it's very modular and you can take a staged approach. You don't have to do it all day one uh, and it's easy to expand it. Uh, but without a grid connection, uh, your peak gen you're trying to size the system so that peak generation, you're below your base load. So that limits the percentage of your own energy that you can displace. If, you, uh, if there is a grid connection, even uh, 11 kilowatts, um, 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 but some of the bigger businesses should be looking at 50 kilowatts. Above that, the normal process applies, which is very slow and indeed expensive. Um, you can then factor in, well, listen, I'll export 20 or 30% of my own electricity at, at peak generation times. I'll broaden the shoulders and I'll be able to overall generate a lot more of my own energy. So that's the benefit of having some type of grid connection. Uh, and payment for export to the grid uh, com coming uh, down the tubes and hopefully will be launched before the end of the year. I'm just going to take you through different projects that we've done in the past 12 months to give you a flavor of how people are thinking. 
that's 130 kilowatt install in Wexford. Wexford's a high generation area that's generating over 900 kilowatts of energy for every solo uh, for every kilowatt of solar PV installed, and it's doing about 35 percent of the piggery's uh, daytime usage. Um, again, a recent install in Dunleary Golf Club, a 100 kilowatt system. Uh, they hope to do about 50% of their own energy. And interestingly, and I don't know if we have any golfers among our, our listeners, but interestingly, um, the PV solar generation, very much in tandem with the golfing year, the same as with the dairy production year, and indeed uh, for many farmers in the, in, in the farming production year. Um, this is a cold store in Cork, uh, installed 300 kilowatts last year, and they're now back looking to install, uh, they're expanding it to 1.5 megawatts. And the motivators uh, was two, um, when I asked the client, says, firstly, what you told me would happen, happened. But secondly, my energy costs is after going up by 30%, and my paybacks after going from six years down to four years. So the energy cost is going to basically drive uh, solar installations going forward in Ireland, in my opinion, as well. Uh, this is a large uh, solar installation we've just completed on a, a potato and vegetable, uh, and again, uh, that installation will generate quite a significant proportion of that farm's energy going forward. Uh, on dairy farms, again, sizing the system, it's easy enough to size the system on a robotic dairy farm uh, where there's a constant base load. That's a 30 kilowatt install in Tipperary and it'll do about 40% of the farm's data energy requirements. Uh, this is a, a solar install on a horticultural farm in Waterford. Um, you can see some of the panels are facing south and some are facing east and west. Um, and again, when the panels are facing south, you'll have the highest generation, but you'll also have a peak of generation in the middle of the day. In some installations, we actually purposely face them east-west, while the overall production might be less, um, we get better usage and better consumption. Um, so those factors have to be taken into account in uh, any plans that you have for a system install. Um, again, businesses that are using energy at 24 seven solar PV is very relevant to, that's 150 kilowatt stall install we've done in Kinmare uh, for super value. That's going to generate about just short of 20% of the uh, business's energy requirements for the year. Um, that's an install on another horticultural farm in Cork, flat roof system, and uh, we put it east west. Uh, the overall production was less than facing south, but we were able to get 40% more panels on the roof. Um, in that situation, we're taking a staged approach uh, we can see the client coming back looking for more solar PV and uh, we have complied with ESB regulations, um, which are, was a limiting, uh, are a limiting factor at the minute, but those rules are changing uh, very soon. Another horticultural farm in Mead, a 60 kilowatt uh, system uh, south facing that uh, is generating close on 55,000 kilowatt hours a year of, um, of electricity. Um, again, solar PV, very suitable for poultry farms. That's a 50 kilowatt system in Monaghan. Um, the attachment to the um, uh, roofs, uh, very often people ask, if it's a trapezoidal roof, we use a kit called a TT kit, where the, um, uh, the rails are attached at the top of the, uh, the box iron, iron um, with um, self-seal uh, tappets, and the panels are attached to that. If it's um, a galvanized roof or um, a fiber cement roof, uh, there will be hanger bolts going into the purlins. And uh, as you can see here, the railings sit on top of that and the panels sit on top of that again. Um, so um, that's a, actually a goat farm in County Westmead done a couple of years ago. Again, the system was positioned uh, east-west and um, um, the RDS in Dublin uh, put in a 100 kilowatt system a couple of years ago. That's generating over 90,000 kilowatt hours of energy a year, uh, just over the Shelburne building. I'm sure many of you are aware of that. Um, on, on dairy farms, and, on, with, um, and generally speaking, the problem on dairy farms is that you have a peak in the morning and a peak in the evening with very low generation during the day. So we either have to divert surplus energy to heat water or divert to battery storage, or when the grid connection comes in, that that surplus in the middle of the day can be exported to the grid. So again, sizing the system and thinking through, uh, can I use the energy and am I sizing the system so that I can use all of my energy or the most of the energy, because that's going to be the quickest payback. I do not see the government making it very attractive in the short term, albeit we've been continuously advocating for it, uh, but we do not see the government in the short term and uh, making it very attractive and economic for people to fill all their roofs 
and export the majority of what they generate uh, to the grid. Um, we were advocating that they should, but I don't see it happening in the short term. Uh, that's a, a, a pig farm in Longford uh, facing south, generating just short of 90,000 kilowatt hours a year. Another pig farm in Kildare, uh, the panels facing east-west. Um, that's an amazing farm. And again, um, I suppose the message and one thing that I see with the whole horticultural sector is your diversity and um, how the changes that you've made and how professional you've become. There's a farm anyone should visit um, in a very remote, poor part of uh, maybe the land, not the best, as you can see the forestry beside it, but he's after turning it into an absolutely fantastic venue for uh, an open farm for kids. And it's just booming. We put 70 kilowatts on, on the roof there. Um, and um, again, uh, robot, uh, robotic dairy farm, that's a pig farm in Wexford, uh, faced them east-west. Interestingly, I just pulled this up. And again, uh, that's the headquarters of uh, Nissan in Dublin. That's actually doing 50% of the energy requirements of that big office block. And uh, we faced them east-west because you got a better spread of generation during the day. And we were able to get 40% more panels on a given area. Um, again, uh, piggeries are uh, very popular for solar PV, no more than for horticulture. The one thing that I would say with horticulture is, and particularly for potato farmers, um, that the June, July period, the fridges tend to be turned off, How, albeit that period is shortening all the time. And that's where the, uh, a grid connection. And one thing I would say in the context of uh, the, the, uh, the participants, uh, most of your farms probably have your, their own transformer. And um, that transformer is going to dictate how much you're going to be able to export to the grid. And an awful lot of homes across the country will be sharing transformers. And while the first home or the second home might get in and might be able to export to the grid, many will not. And what happened in most other countries when the grid was opened up is that the amount at the grid filled up very quickly and that people then later on who wanted to export to the grid weren't able to export to the grid unless the grid was uh, um, upgraded and that comes at a huge cost. Um, this is a, a hotel in Ballycastle, just to uh, give you an indication of what's possible. It's better than carbon neutral. All of its energy is coming from solar and a wind turbine just be behind where the picture was taken. And with heat pumps and smart controls, it's a, be a better than an energy neutral hotel. And I suppose in the context of us trying to meet our 2030 and 2050 targets, um, I, I suspect that in each of your businesses in 20 years time, you'll be boasting um, uh, and, and very satisfied to the fact that you've decarbonized your business in as much as you can uh, while staying in business. And that's a critical part I, I know of uh, um, everyone's business. That's the Lakeland Dairies in, in Cavan, the old Quinn headquarters, they bought it and we put 50 kilowatts of solar. That was generating 46,000 kilowatt hours it generated last year. A great roof for solar facing due south. Just uh, for ground mounted, uh, a ground mount installation, you know, and some people uh, and some businesses don't have enough roof space. The roof space can be the limiting factor or the amount of energy can be the limiting factor or the fact that the, the, uh, a constant base load can be a limiting factor. But um, uh, putting them on the ground uh, can be um, a very cost effective way of um, installing solar PV, except when you go up on frames and you raise them off the ground significantly. Uh, the costs can can rise by between 10 and 20 percent and with the way steel has gone in the recent past it is a, a significant additional cost but it doesn't matter whether they're on the ground or the roof uh, in my opinion if you have the roof space put them on the roof they're safe up there and they won't walk um, um, and again for homes what we see happening now is uh, that particular uh, it's a farmer uh, with an electric car and he um, um, wants to run the house, but wants to basically charge his car um, um, uh, with uh, solar PV. And I can see that uh, happening um, uh, right across the country going forward. Uh, one other good thing with solar PV, it's once you have connectivity on the farm or you have a mechanism of measuring it, uh, there's no hiding place. Uh, you'll be able to look at, um, at any time of the day or historically last week, last month or last year, and you'll be able to see what you're pulling from the grid um, what's coming from the solar PV and what your business is using at any point in time. Uh, useful information and I suppose supporting a, 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 a support to you in that when you make the investment that you have that monitor there 
to make sure that uh, uh, the promises were delivered on. Uh, just very quickly That's on... Just, uh, uh, we've just a little bit less than five minutes, okay? That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, again, in the context, I'm not going to go through this, but buyer beware. Um, I think uh, do the investment uh, in, in time to research the different quality in panels. Um, we offer three types of panels. And again, um, the payback, there's a difference of normally between a half a year and a year, but a German panel with 30 year product and 30 year performance warranty uh, stacks up very well with a, an Asian panel um, um, for, with a 10 year product warranty and a 25 year performance warranty. And warranties do matter. Um, and um, that's a, a picture of some panels that was taken off roofs in the UK after nine years, glass foil panels. Um, and um, just do your research. And um, I know cheap and cheerful may be the way forward. But I, uh, when I went into this business, I researched it carefully and I wanted to uh, present quality uh, to my clients and to provide um, a transparent model. And uh, I certainly think a little bit of time invested into seeing the pros and cons of the different technologies will pay good dividends to you. Um, the inverters, and again, there's all types of inverters. We, can, we use Austrian manufactured Fronius inverters, um, with IP67, they can sit outside um, and they do heat up in a confined space. Um, we had one situation where at four o'clock every day, the inverter tripped and uh, we found out that uh, there was a glass window in the door and the sun was booming in at a particular time every day. And with the heat of the inverter and the sun, it, um, it overheated and tripped. So uh, they do need a little bit of, of space internally if they're inside. Uh, but again, Fronius, they're Austrian manufactured. They come with seven year product warranty, which can be extended to 20. Um, battery storage, a very useful technology. And I think for a lot of businesses will come into its own in time to come. Uh, there are plans, and I, I'm sure um, you, you won't be clapping uh, at these plans where between five and seven o'clock in the evening, for example, there's going to be a more expensive tariff going forward. And I see uh, so, uh, battery storage perhaps playing a role there. Um, and a lot of businesses, you have difficulty with KVAs and the amount of energy that's available. And again, at peak times where the business is flat out, the use of battery storage could be used to shave peaking. But it comes down to economics. And, um, and again, when you're doing an, or you're thinking of buying a bat battery, my advice to you is take the time to research it because it's not a well understood technology, um, but there's a lot of stuff that in my opinion, uh, um, it might have a five-year warranty, but I wonder will it be working in two. Um, the cost very quickly on finances, solar PV can cost anywhere between 700 to 1100 euros per kilowatt of solar PV installed depending on the system size, the roof type, the wiring required and the technology options. And if you can pick a roof close to your uh, fuse boards, you're saving yourself money uh, because uh, cable has gone up twice or three times this year, I think at this point. A uh, grant is very helpful and 40% of it's available uh, can be got through uh, the department uh, schemes, the horticultural schemes, 30% uh, through the BEC, uh, the VATS refundable and the 100% ACA. So the paybacks should be between three and five years. And if you look at energy costs and people are in contract, a lot of you may be at the minute, but if you are renewing a contract today, don't be surprised if you'd be paying 50% more for your energy. It's just the way things are. I don't see it being that way indefinitely. I think prices will ease again, but with uh, what you hear happening right across the world, I think there's going to be a new norm in energy costs. Um, in relation to maintenance, there's no moving parts. Uh, there's self-cleaned self glass generally on, the, on, on panels. Uh, the Irish weather tends to keep them clean. Uh, we've had one instance on a piggery where they were blowing in um, um, feed every week right beside the panels, and certainly some of the dust stuck um, and they had to be cleaned. Um, so, but generally, uh, with panels installed for 10 years, uh, not a problem. Warranties matter. A European warranty uh, that comes with parts, labor, and transport um, is a very valuable thing compared to a nation warranty that comes with a parts warranty if you can prove that there's a problem. And the other thing, people will offer 25 year uh, uh, warranties, but check out the performance or product warranties. Um, your product and your performance warranty should match, in my humble opinion. Battery storage costs between 507 euros per kilowatt, 
coming down not as fast as, as I would like, but again has a role to play. And we put them in on in many places just as a buffer, a small amount of as a buffer between usage and generation. Um, again, in our business, uh, we try we offer three technology options. Uh, we do a financial analysis and the generation report. There's funding options. And, and one thing I would say from this, you shouldn't look at this as another burden on the business. The savings that are made will pay for this if it's sized correctly and uh, installed properly. So um, I think it's the way forward. I think if you can reduce a bill, it's uh, a euro saved is as good as euro earned. Um, and I think with energy costs going up, uh, you're going to see a lot more of that in the future. And just concluding, um, and again, I'm actually this week installing an EV charger on a farm business uh, for the staff. It's not something that will come as a light, but one thing I would say to you, if you do uh, see the need for installing an EV charger uh, for staff or customers, uh, make sure that you have proper controls in place. Uh, because one of the things that I'm finding in hotels, for example, that installed EV chargers a couple of years ago, they're now pulling them out because of no control. Uh, the software and the control of this uh, and who's using the energy and all the rest of it will be important. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Pass. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe if you just uh, transfer back the, the screen sharing there at the bottom. Um, really interesting. Um, you know, I think it, it, they look like one of the great things I, I can see with the solar PV is that there's no interference with the business. You're up on the roof doing your work. You know, there, there's no hassle in putting them in. Um, with uh, just uh, two questions came in there. So we, we'll look at those and kind of maybe it's covered. What's the, the life cycle of a PV panel and what makes do you use or recommend? Um, the, the life cycle of a PV panel is um, where th th there's two types of panels. There's a glass foil panel and that's glass on the top. The cells underneath um, uh, and the cells are wafer tin and then a foil laminate under that. And they normally come with a 10 to 12 year product warranty with a 25 year performance warranty. And nobody has yet been able to tell me how you can claim a performance warranty if you have only a product warranty for half the period. Um, the uh, panel at our premium level that we offer is SolarWatt. It's a German panel. It's, uh, the company is owned by the BMW family. It's in business for 30 years. And the cells are sandwiched between two panes of glass and totally warranted 100% against ammonia erosion, harsh weather conditions. And they come with a 30 year product and a 30 year performance warranty. And they're warranted to perform at over 87% after 30 years. That's worth something, and it's a European warranty, which is very valuable as well. Okay. Um, a follow on from that, and I think we might have dealt with it. On a roof installation, do you need any maintenance? So you said they're, they're self cleaning, which I think is with rain. Um, is there anything else? No, the, um, the, the, the only thing that, in my experience, that can go wrong with a solar PV, there might be a surge of energy or something like that on the grid. We have a very unstable grid and a trip switch will go. Um, other than that, there's no moving parts, there's no plumbing. Um, the panels sit on the roof. We do, um, and our experience is that the Irish weather keeps the panels clean. Uh, that's not to say if you're in a very dirty environment that at some point you mightn't have to clean them, but um, um, that's the exception rather than the rule. Okay, perfect. And uh, lastly then, do the panels let light through if installed in a glass house and is there an impact on light level? So we have seen transparent panels being promoted, but it's not something I've ever seen in use. Yeah, you 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 have a panel, uh, a bifacial panel that does let a percentage of light through uh, and they claim that you get a higher output of solar PV. I think that's very questionable in my opinion and it depends on how they're installed. Um, if you're installing on the, on the roof, I don't see any uh, improvement. Um, maybe if they're installed on the ground uh, with a white surface underneath, there might be an improvement in, in um, but for, um, I haven't seen them installed on glass houses, but I have seen them installed in a lot of horticultural places in Europe uh, where they act as actually a, a cover for a, even in, in uh, vineyards or in that type of outdoor environment. Uh, but I don't think that the, I'm not sure we'd have to do a little bit of work on that, but certainly if the client has a particular interest in it, 
we'll do a bit of research for them. Okay, okay, great. Pat, thanks very much for that. I think we'll have to leave the questions there. I'm going to pass over to Donal and uh, Peter. So thanks again, Pat. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Donal. Uh, so we'll just follow on from that. So I've got Peter here. Uh, so he's going to just basically provide an overview of the heat recovery uh, four, point, four pipe multifunctional uh, heat pump system, uh, like, like Donal said, which is being used in other industries. So uh, Peter McMahon, he's the CEO and founder of an Irish air conditioning and heating systems company, uh, European Indo Industrial Chillers Limited, uh, who have a strong team of engineers who deliver solutions for some large companies in Ireland, such as Salesforce, Pfizer, and the new Central Bank of Ireland. So Peter is a qualified refrigeration craftsperson and technician, uh, a building engineer, and uh, a council member of the, Indus Indus of the industry Institute of uh, Refrigeration Ireland for many years. Uh, so he's also the guest lecturer uh, for level eight students at Technology University Ireland and engineer in Ireland CPD approved registered train provider. Uh, Peter has 33 years experience uh, in, the, in this sector. So look, he's got a lot of experience and I'm, I'm very interested to hear his talk. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Peter uh, to begin his presentation. Thanks very much, Donald. Um, I'll just share the screen here. Good. Okay, I'll just uh, change my duplication. There we go. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Okay, there at the moment. Yep, yeah, that looks fine. Okay, great. Okay, um, as uh, Donald suggested, um, we have a lot of experience um, with multifunctional heat, heat pump technology. So that's really what I'm gonna tell you all about today. Um, this technology isn't particularly new. It's been around probably about 10 years at this stage. We have been promoting it in certain sectors, particularly in the HVAC sector for quite a number of years. And um, there was a lot of resistance against it um, initially. And what turned the tide really was the building regulations. So when the TGD Part L 2017 came in January 2019, it was like the flick of a switch and um, the requirement for renewable energy was exponential. So um, overnight, um, we found the demand for multifunctional heat, heat pumps uh, grew rapidly. And um, the issue in the industry was not many people knew about them. So um, although I'd been promoting this, not many people are listening, um, but all of a sudden the doors opened wide. Um, and I'm constantly delivering um, CPDs with regard to multifunctional heat pump technology. So um, what I've basically done is I've scaled back a three-part designer training program. So this is a program that I give to consulting engineers and the experts in the industry. Um, and as, as Don said, I also give uh, elements of this to level eight students coming out of college. And um, so they're up to speed um, on the latest technologies. Unfortunately, colleges are very, very slow to catch up and um, no dis disrespect whatsoever to the lecturers there. Um, I've had some really, really good uh, conversations with quite a few of them, um, but you know, they, they can't um, deliver cutting edge technology as quickly as we can. We're representing the manufacturers. So anyway, I'm gonna to focus today on multifunctional heat pump technology so you understand how it operates and the benefits of it. Um, it's a water-based system um, as opposed to a DX system. Um, that's the refrigerant. I'm sure a lot of you guys will, will have the X systems installed. Um, uh, I'm also going to mention uh, the importance of volume in your water system, um, very, very important, um, and the consequences of the location of that buffer tank, um, depending on where you put it, can have an effect. Um, and I'm going to tell you one or two other things we can do to improve the efficiency of your uh, heating or cooling system. Okay, so with that, um, every application we get, we try and understand what the requirements are. So what, are you, what is your space heating, space cooling, and domestic hot water? Um, and what can we bring to the table? So basically, we're not selling boxes, we're selling solutions. Um, the first part is obviously to understand uh, what you want. We will deliver the likes of these CPDs um, and conversations just literally to explain the new technologies and to see if it fits in with your requirements. And when we come up with a solution uh, and you buy it, you need some sort of an assurance that you get uh, what you bought. So it does what it says in the tin. So Airmic, one of the manufacturers we represent, 
um, have the biggest test chamber in the whole of Europe. And um, every single chiller heat pump that comes out of that factory is, is Eurovent certified and tested, which means it's independently verified and tested. So um, before we get into the multifunctional heat pump, um, historically, if you wanted simultaneous heating and cooling through a refrigeration system, you would have had a VRS system. So these are very common on air conditioning applications. They're uh, relatively cheap and cheerful, I'll say. But um, now I appreciate a lot of you guys have DX systems, um, but equally you'll appreciate the cost of refrigerant, especially if any of you have had any refrigerant leaks of late, you will know the cost of refrigerant has gone up very, very high. Um, so it's really not as acceptable, let's say, um, from an environmental perspective, an ethical perspective, and obviously a cost perspective, um, to pumping refrigerant um, throughout uh, multiple rooms and multiple buildings. So we want to contain that as much as we can. Um, I am on the Institute of Refrigeration, as was mentioned there, and we're consistently trying to improve refrigeration systems. Um, and one of the best ways we can do that is reduce the volume of refrigerant. Um, so therefore, you can see where we're going with this. The alternative solution was a water-based system. Now, um, the Mizian Plaza there, you'll see it on your telly every single night you turn on the news. Uh, the Department of Health is giving their, their briefings there and um, telling us how, how good or bad we're doing. Um, but it's a great example of a building with a lot of solar glazing, as are a lot of um, office blocks, hotels, factories, you name it, um, where we would have a heating requirement, a cooling requirement at the same time, just as you guys will often have in farms as well. So um, historically, we would have had the chiller that did the cooling. And if you know anything about refrigeration, I'm sure a lot of you guys do, as we're absorbing the heat um, where we're cooling the water, we're, the refrigerant is absorbing that heat and we're dumping it through the condenser. At the very same time, you might have a boiler. Um, I know a lot of you guys might have solid chip or solid fuel, that type of thing, um, to generate heat. When, like I said, we are dumping energy at the same time. So really you can see where we're going with this. We want to recover that energy. So when I started giving this presentation uh, quite a few years ago, we used to say the future is multifunctional heat pumps. It is now very much the norm. There are very few applications now that don't consider multifunctional heat pumps. So what I want to do is to explain firstly what a multifunctional heat pump is. Um, and a lot of you guys will know what they are insofar as you know all the components that are in them. Just as you have a chiller, you have a compressor, a condenser, an expansion valve, and an evaporator. The difference with a multifunctional heat pump is you have more intelligent controls and you have a multiple of four-way valves and suction accumulators to stop liquid refrigerant coming back to your compressors, which is very important. So how do they work? Well, you've basically three modes of operation. So we'll go through each mode of operation here slowly because this is really what this is all about. So you can see we've two heat exchangers here, one for cooling, one for heating. And let's just say it's the summertime, you only have a requirement for cooling. Um, so let's say it's a mushroom farm, um, peak uh, cooling load, no heating load perhaps. Your compressor is pumping your refrigerant through your condenser, on down through the liquid line expansion valve into the evaporator, and then you have refrigerant going back to your compressor. We'll always have two refrigeration circuits, and in this situation, both circuits are dedicated to cooling only. And we use the term EE or energy efficiency ratio. Now, to give you an example, Let's say we had 300 kilowatts of cooling capacity. Let's say we have a combined input power from your compressors of 100 kilowatts. E or is what you get out versus what you put in. So if we simply divide our 300 kilowatts by our 100 kilowatts, the energy efficiency ratio is three, plain and simple. Now, let's say it's the winter time, you have a heating requirement, um, you may not have a cooling requirement. So now what we're doing is we're dedicating both circuits purely to heating. The, the evaporator, the cooling is, is off. Um, so again, we have our compressors pumping our refrigerant down through the condenser or recuperator, depending on the terminology you prefer. Goes back down through the expansion valve. What was a condenser is now the evaporator. It's basically a reverse cycle. Um, and back to your compressor. Now, let's say we have 400 kilowatts of heating. We still have the same input power for argument's sake. Um, this can vary, but I'm, I'm keeping it very simplistic here. Um, so let's say we have our same input power of 100 kilowatts. And again, the terminology coefficient performance is really just what you get out versus what you put in. So let's say we have 400 kilowatts of heating capacity, 100 kilowatts of input power, your COP is four. Very straightforward. Now, this is really where the benefit is. 
if we have a simultaneous requirement for heating and cooling, as I explained earlier, whether it's, it's a process cooling or a HVAC, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> there, are so, <clears throat> there are so many applications. So let me take some water. Okay. So there's a lot of applications where you have a, a simultaneous requirement for heating and cooling. And as I explained earlier, there's no point having a chiller doing the cooling, dumping the energy, and you're generating heat elsewhere when we can recover that energy. So that's really what the multifunction heat pump is all about. So in this situation, you can see the external heat exchanger is completely out of the loop, it's not being used. We're pumping our refrigerant from the compressors down through the recuperator, thereby heating the water with the hot gas. Subcooled gas comes down through the expansion valve into the evaporator, cools the water because you have low pressure, low temperature gas, and then the vapor back to the compressors. So in this mode of operation, you have a new um, term, TER, total efficiency ratio. But again, it's the exact same, what you get out versus what you put in. So let's again say we have our 300 kilowatts cooling capacity. We have our 400 kilowatts heating capacity. That's a combined workload of 700 kilowatts. We haven't added any compressors. We're going to say our input power is the same of 100 kilowatts. So now our TER, what we get out versus what we put in, is seven. Okay. So I'm hoping this is what should be getting your attention now. Okay. And um, this is really what it's all about. So we have more than doubled our energy efficiency ratio by recovering that energy. Okay. Now, um, Ermac used selection software called Magellano. It's a Eurovent certified selection software, which means it's independently verified. It does what it says in the tin. So I did a selection for a client where they had 500 kilowatts cooling capacity, 600 kilowatts heating capacity. The input power is 151. You now know these two combined divided by this gives you your, your TER. This is a pretty much nominal condition, supply seven chill water, return 12, and supply heat, hot, warm water, 45, back at 39. So pretty nominal conditions. Um, of course, if we change those conditions, it will change, it will increase or decrease the efficiency and the performance, okay? But again, just to show you in reality what you can achieve. Now, everything I spoke about there was talking about 100% input, 100% output. We know that loads change throughout the year. So certain process cooling applications have a consistent load in factories, um, mushroom farms, other horticulture applications. The load is going to change often in conjunction with the ambient temperature changing. So we'll often see a profile where the, the heating demand drops in the summer, goes up in the winter. And of course, the complete opposite, their cooling demand will increase peak in the summer and back down in the winter. So with this knowledge, we want to be let's just say a little bit more intelligent about how we go about selecting our equipment. So we try and select the multifunctional heat pumps to operate at maximum efficiency. We're gonna get that maximum TER, and that's where we want the money. So we're a long way down the road from when we first used to start selecting these. Very often people used to oversize. There isn't really a great benefit in doing that. You're better off to buy two smaller units, you'll get a much greater efficiency. So we need to consider what's your actual space heating load, what's your space cooling load, and if you have a domestic hot water load. And if you have a load profile, absolutely brilliant. Some of the engineers in HVAC applications can give us that. I'm not quite sure about a lot of you guys if you can give us that information or not. And um, I know one of my colleagues, Patrice, has worked with um, possibly some of you guys on here today. Um, and we have managed to um, calculate loads um, and, and work with you very closely on that. So um, that's the first component I want to tell you about, uh, the multifunction heat pump. It is all about recovering that energy, and that's obviously what this series of presentations is about, I'm led to believe. The other thing that is very important to mention is buffer tanks. If you have a multifunctional heat pump, as I've just explained, you have three modes of operation, um, and theoretically four, by the way, because you could also have a defrost cycle. Now, we don't tend to get the defrost cycle as much because as you're swapping from heating to cooling, there's a natural defrost occurring. But um, because we have these mode, more frequent mode changes, we need a bigger volume of refrigerant. We, we need to ensure that you don't get erratic temperature control, erratic start stops on your compressors. The equipment will last as it should last. We're not going to reduce the lifespan. So um, if you were to look at this on a graph, you would see the red line is where you have your volume, nice stable temperature control, um, as opposed to your up, down, up, down. Historically, we used to have to try and calculate the volume that was required based upon your capacity, 
the number of steps, number of compressors, your anti cycle time, basically a number of factors we put into the equation. Thanks be to God, the manufacturers made it a lot easier for us now, and they simply tell us so many liters per kilowatt based upon the type of equipment they're delivering, because obviously they know what's built into that piece of kit. So where you may have had maybe four or five liters per kilowatt with a chiller um, or with a heat pump, if it's a process application, you typically double that to seven or eight liters. With a multifunctional heat pump, equally you double it. So you're talking pr pretty much seven, eight, even up to 10 kilowatts or 10 liters per kilowatt, I should say. Um, so you can see the volume was much greater, okay? It is not worth your while reducing that volume. Um, having an extra bit of volume pays for itself. It's well worth the investment in a slightly bigger buffer tank. That's all we're talking about. Um, okay, um, the positioning of the buffer tank is very often underestimated. So I have three slides here to explain the differences um, in where you locate your buffer tank. So the first application here, we can see we have your heat pump here, and we're pumping our water out. Let, or say, let's just call this a chiller for argument's sake. So we're pumping our chill water out to your system that can be fan coil units, it could be a cooling coil in a mushroom form or whatever, it doesn't really matter. On the return, we have the water coming back. So where we may have fluctuations in load, that's going through a buffer tank, which is obviously stabilizing the temperature. So we get a very stable temperature coming out of that buffer tank back to the chiller. So you can see here on the red line, nice stable temperature, which is very, very good for your piece of a, a kit that you've invested a lot of money in. The other op operation, uh, or, or mode of operation, uh, or sorry, positioning, I should say, is where you put the buffer tank on the outlet of your chiller. So here, where we, we might have to compress the cycling on and off and slight variations in temperature here, the buffer tank is gonna stabilize that temperature and you get a very stable temperature going to the process, to the plant. Now, more often than not, you don't need it, but very, very uh, precise. So more often than not, if you are going to put it in series with your loop, we will suggest putting it on the return leg here to your heat pump because we know that's better for your equipment and for the efficiency to the operation of your equipment. Like I said, some people say, no, I need to have a very, very stable temperature and I want to have it on the outlet, in which case that's the other uh, op option that's available to you. However, there is a third option. And this is by far the most common uh, solution that most people would use. So what we do is we put the buffer tank in the middle, basically as a decoupling tank. So we have a primary loop where the chiller is pumping out to the buffer tank and back into the, the chiller again. Secondly, we're coming off the pumps and that's basically pumping down to whatever it happens to be, whether it's HVAC or process cooling. But again, you get a very stable temperature going out and coming back. You can also have variable speed drive pumps on the secondary um, loop here as well um, and have your fixed flow on your chiller side, which is often a requirement. So there's your three uh, typical options. Um, I, uh, by the way, I write articles um, on a lot of these technologies. Um, so feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn um, just go onto my profile page and you'll see lots of the articles. Um, but I have one in particular about buffer tanks. Um, I think it's titled Buffer Tanks Are Not All Created Equally or something like that. Um, and the reason I wrote that one is because I had a couple of calls <clears throat> going back quite a while where let's say, you know, you go into your local um, hardware, you buy a buffer tank. I'll put this way, I had to drive to Donegal one day and we'd sold the chiller. The client said the chiller wasn't working. Um, I went out, the chiller was working away fine, but it was short cycling, I noticed. Um, yet they weren't getting cooling to the factory. Quite simply, they got a big oil storage tank, put it in this attic space I climbed up to, to have a look at, and they had located the outlet from the tank very close to the return back into the tank. And they've done the exact same on the far side. And as you can imagine, both circuits were simply short circuiting. Um, so the positioning of your connections um, or buffer tanks, maybe with baffle plates or sparge pipes um, can all come into play. So um, let's say we have designed our system, whether it be a HVAC application or a process cooling application, a mushroom farm, whatever it happens to be, we can locate our buffer tanks either in series, as you can see on the left-hand side, or as a, um, a decoupling tank in the middle. Um, Donald, are you giving me the, the heads up on five, time here? Five minutes, yeah. No Grand, okay, great. Um, um, so long, long story short, let's say we've designed a very good system. At this stage, people often sit back and say, right, we're happy out there is typically a lot more you can do. So even though, you know, we're, we're saving the planet, uh, the polar bears have a bit of a chance again, like I said, there's always more we can do. 
So I'm really only going to tell you about two things here now before we finish up. One, <clears throat> excuse me, one is a component called a dynamic set point. So if we look at selecting equipment with our software with a, a different set point from six to eight to 10, or we can go to whatever we want, up or down, you automatically will see a difference in capacity and also, of course, in efficiency. So for example, at six degrees C here, supply temperature, we have an EUR of 3.46 and 767 kilowatts. If we increase that to eight degrees, keeping the same delta T, same flow rate, um, you can see that increases to 812 kilowatts on the same unit with a greater efficiency 3.59. So this is what you get out versus what you put in, remember. If we increase our set point to 10 degrees, it increases capacity to 858 and the energy efficiency ratio to 3.72. So straight away, you can see the, the benefits of increasing our set point. So why do we always have a set point on chiller and leave it at that? Well, pretty much because that's what we're told to do. That's the way all the engineers coming out of college have been brainwashed for years and years. Um, now, I'm not saying there aren't situations where you might need a consistent temperature. Sometimes you do need it at six for dehumidification perhaps, but very often as the load changes, we can afford to bring that set point up. We don't necessarily need to keep the same. That is a free component on every single chiller we sell nowadays and heat pump. And we can simply adjust that based upon load or ambient or whatever uh, input we can, a variable we can use. Okay, so dynamic set point, very, very useful component. Um, obviously you can see um, the energy efficiency ratio is gonna increase as the ambient drops, but also as the set point increases. Um, I'm conscious we're short on time, so I'm gonna skip through some of this very quickly. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is different compressors have different part load efficiencies. Um, now, as I said, I'm gonna brush over this very, very quickly, but the only thing I wanna try and get across to you guys is, chillers are at their least efficient when they run to 100% load. So these couple of graphs here are gonna show you um, up at 100% load here, you can see over on the right-hand side, these are all just different ambient curves, by the way. So if we pick the curve in the middle here, let's say the green one, you can see that's an ambient of 27, 28. That's what we typically use in Ireland. Um, the efficiency increases um, as the load drops off, okay? So that's a scroll curve. If we look by comparison, the non-inverter screw, again, you can see at 100% load, it's typically at its least efficient. If we look at the inverter screw, again, it's at its least efficient at 100% load. And um, obviously you'll see the part load efficiency gets much better for the inverter screw compressor. And the final one here, I have the turbo core. You can see it's very, very efficient in part load um, efficiency. So the common theme here quite simply is, most chillers are at their least efficient at 100% load. So where we often have two or more chillers on a system, why do we run them to 100% load? Well, we really shouldn't. Again, it's just because that's what we've been taught to do for so long. So um, where you often will have a system where you might have two chillers and if the load increases, you'll run one till that can't cope anymore, then you might bring on the other. We can be much more intelligent how we manage that. So Ermic developed a component called the multi-chiller sequence controller. And what it does is it communicates with each chiller that you have two or more on the system. And when the first chiller is becoming inefficient, let's say at 70%, it will now bring on the second chiller. The two of them will run at lower load, but at a much greater efficiency, okay? So um, that is the second component. I have a graphic here just to show you how it's installed. So you can see here the multi-chiller controller is monitoring your load by monitoring the temperature difference. There's a correlation, the direct correlation between the delta T difference in return temperature and supply temperature with load, obviously it's proportional. And then, like I said, in turn, it's communicating with each chiller. Don't wanna get overly technical on this, but pl plain and simple, this multi-chiller controller will pay for itself in a very short period of time and by optimizing the efficiency of two or more chillers on any given plant. Okay, um, again, just a couple of samples of applications here. Uh, no two jobs are ever the same. So again, it's all about getting a bit of information off you guys. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? And what can we bring to the table? So we try and understand um, how we can help you there. Uh, it's just a couple of samples at Dublin City Centre there. Most of these are HVAC applications, of course. And this is a variation of, um, uh, this is a slide I just talked off our website. It's pretty out of date, to be honest. But you can see some uh, process cooling applications. Novastrat there, they did underfloor heating the plastics, extra term, you know, the panels, Takeda Pharmaceutical, 
Uh, what else have we got here? I threw a couple of mushroom farms. I don't know if any of you guys are in here. Hopefully you are. Um, uh, threw a couple of them on there just this morning. Um, so you can see they, they vary greatly. Rhonda Foods actually factory recently closed down, off a shame. Uh, dog food down in Arclo there. Carlo Brewing. So you can see the, the amount of applications we come across varies every single day. Um, culture there, actually tree uh, cooling, believe it or not, to preserve the trees. Um, the NRP, these are multifunctional heat pumps. They are now all over the country. We were the first to bring these into the country. Um, the Copeland factory, by the way, up in uh, Cookstown County, Tyrone, um, were the very first site in the whole of Ireland. Um, the fact that they make compressors and they selected Airmec as their multifunctional heat pump uh, supplier um, is probably one of the best references you can, you can get. So uh, that's just a, a sample, like I said, of different applications and different locations all over the country there. So that is it. Um, we are here to help. Like I said, we have a team of engineers and um, we work very closely with you guys to try and basically save you money and give you um, equipment that you can uh, rely on and uh, you know you have confidence in back up there. So, open Thanks, for very much. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, very interesting technology. It might be it might be your bread and butter, but I suppose from, from my perspective and from, uh, I'd say a lot of people on the call, this is quite new technology. And it's great that you're, you're, you're providing it to us. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind just maybe coming off your uh, shared yeah. screen. Sure. And uh, I just have a question here coming yeah. up. So a uh, question, uh, is there a limited limit on how much heat is it can produce? Uh, I presume that is relative yeah. to the, 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 how big a, a kilowatt system you ha you're putting into a unit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we can supply these from, I think it's uh, the smallest one, I think is about 50 kilowatts and the largest one, now they may have changed that since I haven't looked lately. Um, and the largest one I think is up to about near a megawatt of cooling. Um, and of course we can have a multiple of these uh, connected in parallel as well. So there really isn't any limit with regard to the size uh, that, 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 that you can get. Um, what we do though, with regard to sizing is we try and look at the load, as I mentioned there, the, the if we, if we understand the actual heating, the simultaneous heating load, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We want to capitalize on the recovered energy. So there's no point massively oversizing it and having it short cycling. You won't get the benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so can a heat pump keep uh, a three acre glass house at 21 degrees during the day and 19 at nine uh, for nine months of, of the year? Yeah, it would just be a case of calculating what that load equates to and then sizing uh, appropriately. So um, when you say heating, you're, see, if you're only looking for heating, I would not be recommending a multifunctional heat pump. I'd be rec recommending an air, an air source heat pump. So basically a two pipe system. Um, if you require just cooling, I'd be recommending a chiller. If you have a situation where you have a heating requirement, a cooling requirement um, simultaneously, um, I'd be rec recommending the multifunctional heat pump. If you have a heating requirement one time of the year, a cooling requirement another time of the year, a two pipe reversible heat pump would be adequate, you know, because you only need one or other at any given time. So the multifunctional heat pump is really only for where you have simultaneous loads. And that's where you get the benefit of the recovered energy. You know, like I said, where we're cooling one side, we're heating the other, we're getting the heating for free. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's why the mushroom sector has been particularly interested in, in this technology is because they at times of the year they'll be using both heat heating and cooling at the same time. Exactly. So uh, yeah, I suppose that's why it's attractive for, for them. Uh, but it'd be interesting over the next over the next year. I know there's some recent installations happening on mushroom farms at the moment. It'd be, it'd be great to get you maybe back in in a year's time if you have got some data built up from some of these farms. Yeah. Uh, it really tell the story about how efficient the systems are. We've actually asked um, one of our clients if he wouldn't mind doing um, uh, basically recording the data for, for a mushroom farm because we haven't got the data. Um, so basically we're trying to do a before and after. Um, I, I know years ago we used to enter various awards, so it might be an opportunity perhaps to even enter it into um, one of these SEA awards to show the benefits. So, uh, you know, absolutely. I'd love to come back to in a year's time with hopefully some very good data for you. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, look, there's no other questions popping up here in front of me, but I might just pull in Pat uh, just before we, we exit. I just have had one question for Pat myself. Uh, just in relation to the, the solar PV, uh, what is the area required for, say, per kilowatt of, of solar PV you're installing? Yeah, very what good. Yeah, Donald, normally around five to five and a half square meters. 
the panel, um, you, you, something again that people need to be aware of, panels come anywhere in our days from 300 to 450 watts. Mm -hmm. But the number on the energy output per square meter is very little different. It's just that the panels are a bit bigger. Yes. The efficiency gains in solar PV are quite small at this stage. Uh, solar obviously has had a lot of efficiency over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, including the fact that prices have come down by 85 to 90 percent. So you'd want to factor in five to five and a half square meters. Perfect. Okay. Now, from from uh, I suppose from the the mushroom perspective, again, solar is a very attractive option. I would say it's probably a no-brainer in a lot of circumstances. In that, uh, when you're when you're when you're generating your peak amount of energy, uh, it's the time when the the, the growers actually need it because they're cooling crops. So again, a very useful technology for for mushroom farms. But uh, Donald, do you have any questions on your side, or are you happy enough? No, that that's. Um... That's fine. I, I think the, the the heat pumps idea is really it's intriguing and new, but um, and can fit. It looks like it fits very well with mushrooms. Um, so you know, maybe the, the the buffer tanks and efficiencies could be improved there for for maybe the traditional growers um, who are heating and cooling maybe on a on a different type of cycle. But uh, yeah, you know, we, I, I'll leave it there. So I'll say uh, thank you very much to Pat and to Peter for joining us. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Donald. Yeah, no, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pat and Peter also uh, for giving us that useful insight into solar PV and uh, the multifunctional heat recovery system. And Donald, I'd like to also thank yourself for chairing the event. Uh, so look, these renewable technologies are, are something growers should seriously consider uh, investing in over the next few years to reduce not only your carbon footprint, but to also reduce your energy costs. Uh, if any of you uh, tuned in late to the webinar, don't worry, uh, the webinar was recorded and we will put up on our Chagas Horticulture Development Department YouTube channel uh, if you would wish to look back over the, present, the presentations. So uh, just following on from that, on Thursday of next week, we have uh, our third Environmental Sustainable web Webinar. That's the 7th of October. Uh, so on that webinar, we'll be focusing on plastic recycling and uh, we'll also be looking at investigating uh, investigations into packaging and shelf life of horticulture produce. So uh, keep an eye on that the, the Chagas Horticulture Events web, website uh, to register for the event and other events in the future. So look, thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, we look forward to seeing you in future events. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Take care.